Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So we are continuing our study, our reading of this book, The Perfection of Yoga. We have completed two chapters and today we are on the third chapter. Chapter one spoke about giving the example of Arjuna, what yoga is not. Right? Yoga is not just exercise. Yoga is actually very difficult. The real yoga and how Arjuna rejected it, seeing it very difficult for him to control his mind. And then chapter 2, we saw what actual yoga is. Prabhupada introduced her to the yoga ladder and how bhakti is a shortcut method, an elevator that takes us direct to the destination because uh, yoga in this age in Kali Yuga is very difficult. Today, we're going to look at, you, at the third chapter, Yoga as Meditation on Krishna. So we begin. In India, there are sacred places where yogis go to meditate in solitude as prescribed in Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita's sixth chapter speaks about this uh, dhyana yoga, meditation, and all the rules that is required and all different things. So Bhagavad Gita speaks about all margs, karma yoga, jnana yoga, dhyana or hatha or uh, ashtanga yoga, all different things are mentioned. Of course, bhakti yoga. This is to give Arjuna a very, you know, a good <clears throat> evaluated decision he can actually make by comparing all the paths. And of course, Krishna does make a conclusion. He says that bhakti is the best. <clears throat> Traditionally, yoga cannot be executed in a public place. But insofar as kirtan, mantra yoga. So here Prabhupada is drawing contrast between the traditional yoga, which actually is meant to be practiced in solitude, compared to vis-a-vis uh, -vis with mantra yoga, kirtan, or the yoga of chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, is concerned, the more people present, the better. So while the uh, traditional yoga method only uh, allows or once expects a person to be in solitude, kirtana or mantra yoga, the expectation is people to be in numerous number. The more people, the better. When Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was performing kirtan in India some 500 years ago, specifically Jagannath Puri, Odisha, he organized in each group 16 people to lead the chanting. Can you imagine 16 people singing at once in the same tune? And thousands of people chanted with them, meaning after them. This participation in Kirtan, in the public chanting of the names and glories of God, is very possible and is actually easy in this age. But as so far as the meditational process of yoga is concerned, that is very difficult. It is specifically stated in Bhagavad Gita that to perform meditational yoga, one should go to a secluded and holy place. In other words, it is necessary to leave home. Right? If one actually wants to perform yoga, first thing you have to find a secluded place where all the jungles nowadays, all the jungles have been turned into parks. They have been turned into, you know, uh, getaways and and <clears throat> hotels and whatnot. So, and where are the holy places also? Right? The holy places have become commercial districts. So, whatever said and done, one has to leave home. In this age, in this age of overpopulation, it is not always possible to find a secluded place. But this is not necessary in Bhakti Yoga. So it is a very interesting line, Shila Prabhupada writes, in this age of overpopulation, because this has been the theory since the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and even till today, they are saying that, oh, the world is too much overpopulated. And actually, Prabhupada does not go by this notion. In many other writings and uh, talks, you'll hear Prabhupada says that there's no such thing as overpopulation. The world can hold 10 times more the population than it already has. Right? In the times of Mahabharata and Ramayana, there were more population than today. So Prabhupada does not go but by the principle of or the, or the so-called you know understanding of overpopulation theory. In fact, Prabhupada always says there is no such thing as overpopulation. There's just mismanagement of resources. Actually, the amount that the world can produce is enough for even 10 times more the population. But anyways, playing the devil's advocate, Prabhupada is taking this theory and saying, okay, okay, you believe in overpopulation theory, no problem. So in this age of overpopulation, it is not possible to find a secluded place. You believe, right? Overpopulation, then where is the secluded place? Therefore, again, yoga is dismissed. So very interesting stance that Prabhupada takes. <clears throat> 
in the bhakti yoga system there are nine different processes so this is called the nava vida bhakti nine types of bhakti hearing chanting remembering which is shravanam kirtanam vishnu smaranam serving pada sevanam worshiping archanam the deity in the temple praying vandanam carrying out the orders dasyam serving krishna as a friend sakyam and sacrificing for him uh, atma nivedana out of these shravanam and kirtanam the first two hearing and chanting are considered the most important right they are like the king processes the most important of all the nava vida bhakti nine processes at a public kirtan one person can chant hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 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 hare hare if you notice this is the second time proper repeating the mantra in this small chapter while a group of listeners and at the end of the mantra the group can respond in this way there is reciprocation of hearing and chanting i chant you hear you chant i hear like this this can easily be performed in one's own home with a small group of friends or with many people in a large public place so proper is sharing how this mantra yoga is so feasible it can be done anywhere one may attempt to practice meditational yoga in a large city or in a or in a society okay but one must understand that this is one's own concoction and that is not the method recommended in bhagavad gita so uh here proper again says you know that nowadays there are so much yoga studios yoga this yoga that people specifically only come to practice asanas and some pranayama some pratyahara some controlling of food what to take what not to take but practically all the other yama and niyama who practices celibacy right nobody does it so proper is saying that shastra say that real yoga you should practice in some jungle or practice in some mountain somewhere but uh, here we are trying to practice in the city this is not possible okay it is all one's own concoctions okay so <clears throat> uh this is interesting that why is yoga meant to be practiced in uh, seclusion and why not in the cities because so to understand oneself right to understand oneself like proper is going to explain in the next paragraph one needs a little silence so first let us see what bhagavad gita mentions about this yoga if we look here this is a sixth chapter of bhagavad gita 11th verse and 12th verse here it's mentioned suchau deshe pratishthapya stiram asanam atmana na ati uchitam nati nicham so you should be in a clean place suchau deshe stiram asanam a very fixed firm sitting place na ati uchcha not very high na ati neecham not very low not not too high not too low that kind of place you have to find out it's very difficult so many rules to it let's see what proper says further the whole process of yoga system is to purify oneself now proper goes for the essence of it having presented hatha yoga or astanga yoga dhyana yoga and then mantra yoga now proper says the goal of yoga ultimately is self purification and what is that purification purification ensures upon realization of one's actual identity purification means when one is purified from all the externals and realizes one's identity imagine if you have an object let's say a ball or a pen or something that you're carrying and it falls down into mud right and when you pick it up it's all muddy now immediately you wash the mud and then it comes back to its original look that is purification similarly we are also muddy with so many different kinds of designations thinking i'm myself to be from this caste this race this creed this religion this nationality right this belonging that group so all these kind of things create a muddy identification and we need to purify ourselves of all this to understand what next line purification is realizing that i am pure spirit i am not matter due to material contact we are identifying ourselves with matter and we are thinking i am this body but in order to perform real yoga whether dhyana or mantra or whatever it is one must realize his constitutional position as being distinct <clears throat> from matter 
the purpose of seeking out a secluded place and executing the meditative process is to come to this understanding. So like I said, why seclusion? Is to come to this understanding that I am not this body. Going into seclusion, going away so that the person, the practitioner can meditate and understand empirically that I am not this body. You know, sometimes the yogi may go and sit in one place and look at ants dying or look at ants moving, look at the bird flying, look at the bird dying. And then one gets some realization that I have nothing to do with these externals. Okay, that is a purpose. Now, it's not so easy. This is not possible to come to the to this under it is not possible to come to this understanding if one executes the process improperly. Like nowadays, people are doing yoga for health. They will never come to the understanding that I'm not this body. Right? So we see in the city life, let's compare city life with this seclusion. <clears throat> Whenever a person wants realization or wants some meditation or wants some reflection, they always go to a quiet, serene place like mountains or valleys away. This is because in such place, when one puts oneself in front of nature, one becomes very small. Big mountain, big valley, big lake, right? Big nature is that you become very small because you realize you're powerless. If it rains, what do you do? You have to take shelter. The sun is too hot, you have to take shelter. You have to look for water, you have to look for food. So, so much of dependency in the way nature moves that you realize that I'm nothing. I'm insignificant. But compare this with the artificial civilization in the cities where a person wakes up early morning, one button he press, the alarm stops. Another button he press, shower comes, he takes a bath. Another button he press, the microwave oven turns, he gets his breakfast. Another button he presses and you know he unlocks his car. Another button he presses, the car starts on its own. Another button he presses, he goes to office, he enters the lobby, right? Another button he presses, he enters the elevator. Another button he presses, the computer or the laptop switches on. Another button he presses, the air conditioning turns on and changes the whole environment. Another button he presses, he gets coffee or tea for free. Right? Just pressing one. So it becomes a one button life. Doing this again and again throughout the whole day, slowly but surely, the modern man starts to think, this finger is so powerful. Just one button, everything starts. The whole world moves because of this one finger. Slowly he starts thinking what? I think I am God. Right? God-like powers. One push, everything functions. But it doesn't work like that in nature. Therefore, the modern civilization is very artificial in creating that illusion that I am in control. When in reality, we are not. And therefore, when something happens, we become a little, not a little, we become quite disturbed. So anyways, in any case, this is this is the consideration of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. What Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has to say about yoga, dhyana or mantra, which? So Mahaprabhu says, Harer nama, harer nama, harer nameva kevalam, kalau nasteva, nasteva, nasteva gatir anyata. One of the most profound verses. In this age of quarrel and disagreement, Kali Yuga, there is no other way of spiritual realization but this chanting of the names. There is no other way, no other way, no other way. Three times. Nasti Eva, Nasti Eva, Nasti Eva. There cannot be any way. But only Harer Nam. It is generally thought, at least in the Western world, that the yoga system involves meditating on the void, thinking about nothing. But the Vedic literatures do not recommend meditating on any void. Rather, the Vedas maintain that yoga means meditation on Vishnu. Krita yat dhyayato Vishnu. In the age of Satya Yuga, meditation was on Vishnu. Krita yat dhyayato Vishnu. And this is also maintained in the Bhagavad Gita. In many yoga societies, we find that people sit cross-legged and very straight and then close their eyes to meditate and so 50% of them go to sleep. Because when we close our eyes and have no subject matter of, for contemplation, we simply go to sleep. The Prabhupada is being very frank here. And many of the yoga places, they have nice air conditioning also. Of course, this is not recommended by Sri Krishna and Bhagavad Gita. One must sit very straight and the eyes be only half closed, gazing at the tip of one's nose. This is all mentioned in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. If one does not follow the instructions, the result will be sleep and nothing more. <laughs> Probably <getting clears throat> funny here. So the eyes are not completely closed. 
the eyes are not completely open. If you completely close them, you will fall asleep. If you completely open them, you'll be distracted. So half closed, looking at the tip of the nose. All right. I'm sure some of you must be trying when you're hearing this. Sometimes, of course, meditation goes on when one is sleeping. But this is not the recommended process for execution of yoga. Thus, there are people who fall asleep and while sleeping, they're meditating. So, but there's a rare case, a different thing. They, I mean, when we fall asleep, we don't even have control over what we're thinking about. Thus, to keep oneself awake, Krishna advises that one always keep the tip of the nose visible. In addition, one must be always undisturbed. If the mind is agitated or if there is a great deal of activity going on, one will not be able to concentrate. So, you know, especially in today's world when so much demand is there, so much artificial demand for money, work, career, job, so on and so forth. When actually people go home and they try to meditate, the mind is just bombarded with different thoughts and different ideas and this and that. And it becomes very difficult to concentrate. In meditational yoga, one must also be devoid of fear. Right? Now, this is very difficult because in today's world, there's fear for everything. Fear of losing your job, fear of not being able to maintain your family, fear of losing your life, fear of this, fear of that, day in, day out. There is no question of fear when one enters spiritual life. Abhayam, that's the verse that says that, you know, what, uh, spiritual life means akuto bhayam, where there is no fear. And one must also be a brahmachari, meaning completely free from sex life. Because this is yoga linking with Lord. Nor can there be any demands on one meditating in this way. No, there's no demands. When there are no demands and one execute the system properly, then he can control his mind. Demands means want this, want that. Sometimes when you sit down, like, no, I need this, I need that. I, I have to have this, I have to have that. What about this, what about that? This kind of demanding nature, no? After one has met all the requirements for meditation, he must transfer his whole thought to Krishna or Vishnu. It is not that one is to transfer his thought to vacancy, to void. Thus Krishna says that one absorbed in the meditational yoga system is always thinking of me. Right? Krishna says this in the end of Bhagavad Gita, uh, sixth chapter, that person in yoga is always thinking of me. The yogi obviously has to go through a great deal of difficulty to purify the Atma. Atma here has many meanings. The word Atma has seven meanings. Here Atma can mean mind, body, soul, whatever. But to purify all this, so much difficulty that this yogi has to go through. Can you imagine um, trying to calm the mind? So it's very difficult. Like You go work the whole day and every evening you come back, you try to meditate in this fashion. And then only to go back to work the next day and get ourselves cluttered. The yogis used to give up everything and just go for purification, purification, purification. For us, if we want to practice yoga, it's like, you know, purifying, getting messed up, purifying, getting messed up. It's very difficult. So this dhyana process is very tough. But mantra yoga, you can always be Krishna conscious, even at work, right? Or even while going to work or coming back from work, one can be absorbed in remembering the holy name of the Lord. But it is a fact that this can be done most effectively in this age simply by chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Third time. No? Why is this? Because this is transcendental sound vibration is non-different from Krishna. This transcendental sound vibration of this mantra is non-different from Krishna. When we chant his name with devotion, then Krishna is with us. This is the difference between mantra yoga and dhyana yoga. Dhyana yoga requires so much of prerequisites. But mantra yoga, one can chant anywhere, anytime. And the moment one chants, Krishna is with, because, with the person. Because Krishna and Krishna's name is non-different. And when Krishna is with us, then what is the possibility of remaining impure? Consequently, one absorbed in Krishna consciousness, in chanting the names of Krishna and serving him always, receives the benefit of the highest form of yoga. So, how to remain, uh, how can one remain pure? So, the more we chant, the more we become Krishnaized, right? The more we are Krishna conscious. So, if one is feeling that I'm chanting, but still I'm not very pure, then we should chant more. The advantage is that he does not, he doesn't have to take all the trouble of meditational process. 
That is the beauty of Krishna consciousness, right? In yoga, it is necessary to control all the senses. And when all the senses are controlled, the mind must be engaged in thinking of Vishnu. This is a step-by-step -step process. First, they control all the senses, then engage the mind. This is Dhyana Yoga. Bhakti Yoga or Mantra Yoga is, you know, all senses engage in Krishna service, the mind engage in Krishna service, everything together in one shot. And it's very happy, right? You can engage, the senses engaged in dancing, taking prasadam, hearing kirtan, hearing nice lectures, studying, reading, talking, traveling to holy places. Like this, it's more pleasurable. One becomes peaceful after thus conquering material life. Jitatma Prashantasya Paramatma Samahita. Very powerful verse in 6 ca chapter of Bhagavad Gita, 7th verse. That one who has controlled his mind, the Paramatma is already achieved. One who has controlled his mind, super soul is already achieved. Right? For one who has conquered his mind, the super soul is already reached. For he has attained tranquility. Tranquility means equality, peace. This material world has been likened to a great forest fire. As in the forest, fire may automatically take place. So in this material world, although we may try to live peacefully, there is always a great conflagration, always a great fire burst. All right? There is no peace in this world, how much ever we may try for it. It is not possible to live in the peace anywhere in the material world. It's a powerful, important reminder line. But for one who is transcendently situated, either by meditational yoga system or by the empirical philosophical method or by bhakti yoga, that means yoga, any form of yoga, whether dhyana yoga or jnana yoga or bhakti yoga, actually makes a person transcendental. So when a person is transcendental, then a person is not worried. He is equal in both happiness and distress, good and bad. So in such a situation, peace is possible. All forms of yoga are meant for transcendental life. So we agree that dhyana is good, right? It's, it is it is uh, valid, but it's just not for this age. All forms of yoga are meant for transcendental life, but the method of chanting is especially effective in this age. Kirtana may go on for hours and one may not feel tired, but it is difficult to sit in lotus position perfectly still for more than a few minutes. Right. Nowadays, we, we ask people to come sit down, their legs start getting cramps because we have just no practice of it. Yet, regardless of the process, once the fire of material life is extinguished, one does not simply experience what is called impersonal void. So, just because this, uh, you know, one has overcome material nature does not mean one enters into void. Rather, as Krishna tells Arjuna, one enters into the supreme abode. Yunjannevam sadatmanam yogi niyata manasam shanti nirvana paramam matsamstam adigachati. By meditating in this manner, always controlling the body, mind, and activities, the mystic transcendentalist attains the kingdom of God, right? Through cessation of material existence. One gets the nature of the Lord, but some stam, the Lord's place, Nirmana Paramam. Krishna's abode is not void, it is like an establishment, industry or business. In an establishment, there are a variety of engagements. The successful yogi actually attains to the kingdom of God, where there is spiritual variegatedness. Okay, so in this world, we are enjoying variety, and to think that we're giving this all up to go to a place where it is void, that is a little scary, a little boring even. If here there is variety, in the spiritual world, there is sweet variety, beautiful variety, right? Variety which lasts forever. But variety there must be, because that is enjoyment. The yoga process are simply ways to elevate oneself to enter into that abode. Actually, we belong to that abode. We are from there. But being forgetful, we are put into this material world. So, it's not one should not think that I'm trying to reach somewhere. Actually, I'm just trying to go home. Right? Back home, back to Godhead. We are from there. We have come here. This is an artificial condition for us. Right? That is a natural position for us. So don't think that practicing bhakti is doing something artificial. This is actually being the most natural you can. Just as a madman becomes crazy and is put into a lunatic asylum, so we, losing sight of our spiritual identity, become crazy and are put into this material world. Amazing. 
Thus, the material world is a sort of lunatic asylum, uh, mental home. And we can easily notice that nothing is done very sanely here. If you think about it, all the forms of education, all the forms of modernization, all the forms of businesses, what not people have done. It's all crazy. Inventing new things, trying out new things, creating new things, fashion. Okay. If you look at the recent fashion trends, people are just, they're just, you know, hats which are two feet long and dresses which has more holes than a net. And, uh, you know, funny, funny things. Why? Because people are crazy, right? In education, they're creating new, new types of uh, forms of education. Uh, if you go to eat in five-star hotels, right, the person who studied to become that expert chef or connoisseur, you know, he started, spent four years in a college learning how to just put one small piece of food on a white plate with just a line and charge you some, you know, hundreds and hundreds of whatever currency for it, right? So our real business is to get out and enter into the kingdom of God. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives information of this kingdom and also gives instructions about his position and our position of what he is and what we are. This is an important understanding. If we want to go there, we need to know who God is, who we are. All the information necessary is set forth in the Bhagavad Gita and a sane man will take advantage of this knowledge. Right? So beautiful mention by Srila Prabhupada. So um, we end the chapter here. Srila Prabhupada ki jai.